Welcome to another episode of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is my friend and colleague, Sharon Milnick. I'll tell you about Sharon in a moment. Uh, uh, Grace Under Pressure is an interview show that poses questions to thought leaders and doers like Sharon, who are helping us come to greater understanding of ourselves, especially now in crisis. Grace Under Pressure reveals what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, you know, the caring, the connecting, commitment we feel toward one another. Grace for me is generosity, respect, compassion. And when we do it as a leader, especially in challenging times, requires the ability to act for the benefit of others and energize the whole organization. So it's my honor to welcome Sharon Melnick. Welcome, Sharon. So. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here with you, John. You're such an inspiration to me. Well, you're too kind. Uh, checks in the mail. Uh, let me tell the folks a about you. Sharon is a PhD. She's a leading authority on stress resilience and women's next level success. And she's going to give us some insights. Uh, she is Harvard trained at the Harvard Medical School. She's worked for with a mere 40,000 clients and trainees in over 50 different Fortune 500 companies. And she's a much sought after speaker, or at least she was <laughs> before the lockdown. Uh, she's spoken at the White House as well as the UN. Uh, she's a business psychologist. She's known for her practicality. In other words, beyond theory. Her first book is Str Success Under Stress, Powerful Tools to Stay Calm, Confident, and Productive. Her second book is Confidence When It Counts. And she has a new ebook, which is From Pigeonholed to Promote It, which focuses on helping mid-career women achieve their potential. Um, she is has a special mission to help women become more empowered, I say, but act uh, for the benefit of the team. She's a go-to executive coach, and don't I know that? She has she and I have presented together, and she's a remarkable um, uh coach and counselor and speaker, and I have learned much from her. So welcome, Sharon. So, Thank you so much, John. I'm so glad to be here with you. Um, I open these sessions with um, a similar question. We're all feeling a lot of stress. So what do the executives with whom you work um, talk about right now? What do they tell you? I mean, it's universal, right? It's the too much to do, not enough time, no, um, uh, you, you know, I mean, they're they're trying to eat lunch as they're double tasking and, you know, d double booked in meetings back to back. No time to think, but they're paid to think um, a, a lot of responsibility. Right. And it just um, I think it just feels these days like nothing can give. Right. And um, and I, I think people feel uh, very in the crunch of it and. And everyone in their own way. I mean, certainly the working parents, especially if you have school age children or young children, you know, literally doing two full time jobs with what we know is uh, working moms uh, doing actually 20 hours uh, extra a week of um, all of that child care and home care. And um, it's, uh, I, you know, I think that in the first few months of the uh, pandemic, it was, you know, people were in fear and were in stress and, you know, the uncertainty uh, of it all. And I think all of that is still there kind of underlying. But on top of that, we're we're just really at an opportunity where we need to prevent burnout. I mean, we're, we're just getting worn down. <laughs> and uh, how, how do we sustain it? It feels unsustainable. Right. You said something interesting. We'll get to the uh, avoiding burnout in a moment because you are an expert in that. Um, but you said executives are paid to think with. I don't disagree with that at all. Um, but you are saying they don't find time to do it because they're doing other stuff. Correct. Is that well, I think that there's two things. So one is um, that it's hard to have time to think when you are consumed every moment with back-to-back -back meetings um, or interruptions and distractions. So I think that that's one of the things, right? Is right. that you, you literally like can't carve uh, out the time. But the second thing, and this um, I think we're definitely gonna uh, wanna go more into is that um, because of the always on nature of what we're facing these days is that we literally can't access the part of our brain that does that deeper thinking and can see for the bigger picture. Great. And that's where resilience comes in. So give us the big picture of resilience and then we'll drill down on it. 
So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I think um, when we think of resilience, you know, kind of like, you know, common um, uh, in, in our culture, like the way that we think of it is like they were resilient, like a person went through a difficult situation and then they kind of rose from it and they made something of it or made something of themselves uh, from it. And I think that um, being resilient in these times is is definitely about bouncing back. It's definitely about being able to maintain a sense of realistic optimism, you know, in these times. So for sure. But I think also uh, in these times, I think the way that I think about resilience is it's also about kind of your moment to moment reactions, right? So like being able to stay in your center, being able to stay in your flow, right? And, uh, and so that you can kind of bring your best self in any given moment. And I think that that's what's important in these times. That's great. I said, I, I've always, I've always agreed with, uh, I've always agreed with you, of course. I've always agreed with your definition of resilience as a, as a, uh, as a, um, a bouncing back from adversity. Um, Eileen McDarg has this philosophy of bouncing forward and because we're meeting a new challenge. Do you, is there something to that that resonates with you? So. Yeah, I love that. And not bouncing back, bouncing forward. I think that that's absolutely right. And, you know, the single best question that I ever ask myself and that I think can lead someone to bounce forward in that way is this. How might this be happening for me, not to me? What a powerful question. Instead of, instead of playing the victim, natural, we find maybe I'm more in control. Yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that when we think about stress, I think that we think of it in terms of, you know, it's the hundredth email or it's the pressure of the deadline or it's the person who's, you know, constantly chatting over here and I can't get their noise out of my head or, you know, whatever uh, it is, or just feeling like I'm just so exhausted. And it is those things, but actually, technically speaking, you know, stress is not out there. It's in here. So it's our experience right? Um, it's the quality of the experience that we create inside of ourselves, which is really what determines how we go through any situation, how it's going to wear and tear on our body or not, and um, who it's going to enable us to become or what, you know, outcomes we're going to be able to create. And, you know, the, the good news, so to speak, in that is that actually that is the, the thing or maybe the only thing that is within our control. Great. You, uh, I interviewed you for an article of Smart Brief, which is one of the favorite places I like to uh, publish. And you taught, you spoke about turning things on, uh, turning on and off. So how can we do that? So. Yeah, this is so key, right, to resilience and just to sustaining oneself uh, throughout this time. So let me, uh, can I take a minute here and be like a little wonky Professor Melnick for just for a second? Okay. So, um, you know, when it comes to dealing with stress, we have our nervous system and it has an on button, our sympathetic nervous system and our off button, the parasympathetic nervous system. Now our on button gives us energy and focus to solve problems and back to back meetings and kind of, you know, uh, rise to the task. Our off button gives us access to calm and rejuvenation. Now, the way that we're supposed to be kind of coordinating, you know, like in caveman and woman times, we like defend ourselves from the woolly mammoth, you know, all, you know, fight or flight. But then we'd be in the dark cave resting, digesting, maintaining our immune system, making cave paintings. The way that we live today, we are always on. Everybody is experiencing this right now. There are consequences to this because... Uh, each has a mode of operating. Now, when you're on button mode, it's very reactive to the email that just came in, you know, any stress that's kind of like right in front of you right now. And this is very helpful to tick things off your list to get through the tactics of your day. However, your on button can only reference the past in order to know how to do things, right? It, it just has well-worn grooves. It's like your survival mechanism. It's like, have we done this before? And it's, you know, how does this affect me? It's all about me. It's a kind of survival focused. 
and we have an experience of time famine and we can't distinguish between what's foreground and what's background. So everything feels like a priority. I have to be the one to do it. <laughs> You know, there's no asking like, what do I want or what do I need? Like that, those are just not questions, you know what I mean, that you can really get to. So you need your on button. That's how it's enabled you to have every success from carrying out tasks to date. However, yeah. if we're only on, we're denying ourselves our off button. That well, before you do that, I mean, yeah. I, I know you work with clients like this because I know I have. It's They take pride in, in my on button, if you will. Like, I'm a go-to person. I'm a, uh, uh, That's how I made my reputation. So um, tell us the part of this, the next part of the story. So. Yeah, well, I love that you said that because it's true. We, we have bragging rights uh, around that. And let me tell you why that's old school right is because um your on button you definitely uh need it obviously but your off button is actually your genius button because uh -huh. it enables you to take a step back to see the bigger picture to connect the dots to tap your creativity your innovation your intuition to project more long term into the future to be more strategic right and uh, you know if you're a leader you're only as good as how far into uh, into the future, really, that you can vision and take people. So your off button, it's really, you know, the punchline here, of course, is that you want to be able to balance your on and your off button. I mean, that's optimal performance. You just made a wonderful business case for the off button, which I'm going to guess is counterintuitive to so many hard charging executives because I didn't get to where I am now by being, you know, relaxed or whatever. I tackle problems and I go forward. So that's old school. <laughs> well, you know, you know, really the name of the game is to have coordination between kind of both of these systems. And here's why. Uh, because best case scenario really is to be able to access that bigger picture thinking, strategic thinking, to have the big ideas and then go into your on button mode, carry it out, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, you know, and then to take a step back. How is this working? Where does this fit in? Where are we going from here? Or prioritize my day or my to-do list, then go in and, you know, kind of do it. And that's really what's best case uh, scenario is when you can coordinate. But what happens is that when we get caught up on this treadmill, right, of always on, then everyone is just kind of scurrying through their day, just trying to get things done. And we're not necessarily taking a step back and sort of asking, are we getting the right things done? Are we doing this in the most you know, efficient way? Um, you know, How is what I'm doing affecting people upstream and downstream uh, from me? And this is where we can get into kind of turf wars and politics and um, rework and all of those uh, kinds of things. And you know something, we just can't afford that kind of churn and that wasted energy these days. We just need every moment to bring our best. Right. How do we, can, okay, uh, is resilience something we're born with or can we develop it? Oh yes, absolutely. Um, so what I'm talking about in terms of the on and the off button, that uh, this simply comes from um, managing your nervous system, right? And, uh, you know, it's, it's not really about time management per se, it's about self-management, right? And um, so in terms of resilience, here's what you can cultivate. And then I, I think we should actually go into uh, some of these strategies is Wait, that right. I think that there's three things that go into resilience. Uh, there's three things that you can control. You can control your own physiology, you can control your own psychology, and you can control your own problem solving around your performance. Right? Great. And, yeah, three things. Uh, I'm all ears. <laughs> uh, psycho physiology, psychology, and problem solving. Yeah, right. All with a P. So. <laughs> Good. So let's take uh, physiology because that seems to be the one that would be hard. And I think, you, do you have a, a breathing exercise for us on that or am I? Yeah. Off yeah. 
Yes, I love it. Let's uh, let's do it. And this is so important, uh, John, because, you know, when I do uh, trainings in organizations or, or team trainings, I always make sure to demonstrate in the way that we're going to do right now, because if you tell um, busy warriors, just like you were you know, talking about a few minutes ago, like you need to breathe. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like I'll sleep when I'm dead and I'll breathe when I, you know, when I come <laughs> right. and uh, I don't have time to breathe. And um, if just just FYI, if you're saying to yourself, you know, I, I don't have time for this, that is literally a sign that you were caught up on that reactive cycle and that treadmill. And it's like you need it more than anyone else. <laughs> okay. That's a good. Yes. Our, our body is telling us this stuff. <laughs> so. I love it. Yeah. So um, in terms of like um, that idea of the on button and the off button, this is what you want is you want uh, an immediate way of being able to balance your on and your off button and go through your day like that. Now, there's many ways to access that off button, but really your mind follows your breath. And so actually one of the fastest ways to get to a calm and clear thinking state is by managing your physiology. So let's do a breathing technique that will help us to do this. I call this the mental reset, right? Yep. Uh, the mental reset. And this is a, a three-part breath. So we're going to inhale through our nose. We're going to hold and we're going to exhale. All in through your nose, hold, and then exhale through your nose. I think we should have a lot of practice doing this. This is not be novel for anyone. Um, okay. And I'm actually going to count it out uh, for you. And um, if you really want to kind of get the maximum benefits, you can actually put your hands, like have all 10 fingertips touching like this. And it's um, it just helps to balance kind of the, the left and the right hemispheres. And all this, you're going to see like very calming, um, rejuvenating energy. And it just keeps it inside of you rather than dispersing it. Okay. So uh, are you open for this? Absolutely. Okay. Great. So I'm, I'm going to get my little handy timer here. Close your eyes if you feel comfortable uh, at home and uh, don't blow this off. This is not a time for like a bathroom break or anything. This is like you need this. And, and, you and, need and it. I'm going to I would And you're going to tell me you feel so much more calm and clear headed and instantly. Are you ready, John? Okay. I'm ready. Inhale, two, three, four, five, and hold two, three, four, five, and exhale all the way out. And inhale, two, three, four, five, and hold, two, three, four, five, and exhale all the way out. And inhale, two, three, four, five, and hold, two, three, four, five, and exhale all the way out. Very good. And inhale from your belly and hold, two, three, four, five, and exhale all the way out. We're going to keep going a little more. Inhale, two, three, four, five, and hold, two, three, four, five, and exhale all the way out. And inhale from your belly. And hold. And exhale all the way out. And inhale. And hold. And exhale all the way out. And last time. And hold. And exhale all the way out. And as it feels comfortable for you, just kind of like reorient your attention to our podcast here or our live. And so let me hear from you, uh, John. Uh, how do you feel now? I think our podcast is over because I'm totally relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a great exercise. And uh, I do. W what's important to know um, is that you feel this physically. It's a physiological change. 
And I always like to say that um, we live, we're knowledge workers, so we live in our heads and, and we forget our bodies so often. And so this breathing exercise is so important. So I heartily recommend it and other things. So thank you. This was great. Yeah, absolutely. So just um, uh, insider information of what was going on there uh, in your body. So um, is that when you inhale, you activate the on button. And when you exhale, you activate the off button, which is why we say exhale, you know, like relax, right? So it's actually very, very uh, important. The exhale is very important. And uh, when we're under a lot of stress, um, you know, usually we're taking very rapid and shallow breaths and it just kind of keeps us, it perpetuates that like, <gasps> you know, sense of frantic um, freneticism. And uh, so this is like an instant way. I mean, do you know how long we did that for, John? It, was, it seemed like five minutes. Five. Yeah, it was, it was like a little under two minutes. Yeah. It was and, a and, minute 55. But it's refreshing. So I like it. Now, I do trainings on this, you know, and I, I demonstrate this and, you know, you often see on the chat, you know, feeling really relaxed. My mind feels open. Um, I feel more focused. I feel more expansive and like literally two minutes, you know, in your day. And this is really what you want is you want to kind of like pulse between your on button and your off button. It's a, a high performance uh, technique and it will sustain you. It trains your body how to ha access that uh, off. And then when you're ready to go to bed, uh, your body will be somewhat familiar with what it's like to feel off. So is this something you can do to help go to sleep in the evening? So Absolutely. You can definitely... Uh, I would do this, you know, mid morning and mid afternoon break. I would do it before you go to sleep. And um, it's a good, uh, you know, a question that you asked that, because I think when we get so um, uh, kind of, you know, caught up and so stressed is that it, it feels like there's nothing that we could do. Like, it's just, I just have too much to do. Like, I, it just nothing can give. And, um, you know, we only feel that stress when things feel out of our control. That is what actually activates the stress um, in our body. And I really want your uh, viewers to see that actually there's so much more that you can control, right, than you um, may be exercising. That's, that's great. And I'm, I'm glad you do this. I want to, for purposes of time, move forward. We have the physiology. Now we come to the psychology. And I'm my question, because I know you get it, is... Dr. Melnick, you don't understand how busy I am and how much people need me. So take it away. So, um, I'm sure that that is true, that you're important to many people. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's uh, this, this touches a little bit on um, kind of your performance as well as your psychology. I'd say, you know, kind of both of those domains. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit... Um, like when I was talking about time management, you know, clarity is your best time management tool, right? And um, I think that, uh, you know, when I, um, when I wrote my book, uh, actually my first uh, book, Success Under Stress, we were talking about that, whoops, there we go, is um, that, you know, even then there was a study, so this is, you know, good six-ish years or so, but even then um, there was a study that come out that said 65% uh, of senior leaders um, know that they have too many objectives and that their people will never get to all of them. Right. Hold, you know, the, hold the book up again because I put you on widescreen. So oh, okay. Thanks. That's under, That's under stress. Powerful tools for staying calm, confident, and productive. When right. the it's a good book. And um, it's just a solution for all of the um, overwhelm that people are facing these days. And uh, so I do think that it's uh, very important for us to really be strategic and for us to be asking questions about, you know, what really is most important? What really are our priorities? Or, you know, are we just kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall and kind of, you know, stressing our people out? And I, I think it's important now that ever, now that we know that, that people are just drowning, especially, uh, you know, the working parents, and I think if you're a leader of a team or no matter who you are, even if you don't have positional power, you have power, right? And um, on your team, and I would bring up uh, kind of a conversation around like, uh, the, like what I call the ideal day exercise. Like what really would an ideal day look like? Like if we, you know, and I, you know, I've done dozens of these, you know, kinds of trainings for teams. And what people say is, you know, I want to get the most meaningful work done. 
and I want to feel valued and I want to feel like I have something left over at the end of the day for the people and the things that I love the most. You know, these are kind of common refrains. And so if you could talk together as a team about, okay, so here are all the things, you know, we have a collective vision about what we want and how we want to go through our days. Now let's reverse engineer that. Let's talk about kind of solutions for that. You hear this intentionality is um, is so important these days because people are just trying to survive the day. But when you really think about how do we reverse engineer and how do we work together with one another? How do we create times when we can actually get things done and not be pulled you know, into meeting? So how can we accommodate you know, parents who need a certain schedule? And to really just kind of get into the nuts and bolts of um, talking through together, I think it's very, very uh, important. And I think it's very important to talk together about the things that um, waste uh, our time and energy, like rework, like politics, like chasing people down, you know, and I, and I think um, everyone uh, really, um, you know, when the, 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 the thing that I said that, you know, that it's only when things are out of control that you feel stressed, you really, really want to maximize what you can control. The mantra that I think is um, kind of the one to hold on to going forward is be impeccable for your 50%. Be impeccable for your 50%. So really maximize what it is that you can control. And part of that is bringing up these discussions, you know, on your team. Part of that is being respectful of other people on your team and not sending things that aren't ready, not giving unclear directions, not bombarding people with email or whatever. And it's like if each person is impeccable for their 50 percent in the service of this common vision, you'll see performance soar and uh, burnout will be prevented. That's great. And I, I like the way you have transitioned to a leader's responsibility for others. But um, just as you, uh, so a question came to mind is sometimes um, we're, we're good at acting for others, but not so much for ourselves, especially leaders in a, the most senior positions, because they feel that they must do it all themselves. Do you have a a technique or a methodology to help those folks who are feeling overwhelmed. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, each person wants to really think about like, what is the contribution that you're there to make and what really like really have role clarity, you know, and um, kind of decide that for yourself. And then of course, in conjunction with a manager or a management team uh, of colleagues, et cetera, and really make sure that that's kind of attuned. And then, you know, really um, uh, show up and carve out your time in terms of the best leverage use of kind of who you are, what your strengths are, and what the organization uh, needs from you. And when you were talking about like, you know, the psychology approach before, you know, there's many, many mindsets that are really key um, to sustaining oneself in these times. And one of the things that I think is just the most important kind of meta, I think the, I think the word of the year in my book is intentionality, intentionality. Like we just can't like survive and be, re, you know, reactive and just get caught up anymore. I think it's so important to really be intentional. We were just talking about what that looks like kind of as a, you know, as a leader of a team, the leader creates the weather on the team, right? So the, see, yeah. the leader creates the weather on the team. I've heard you say that before. I love that. So tell us what that means. So. so it's like, again, this idea of like, you know, what is the experience that you want people to have that will help people to thrive, to feel included, to feel they belong, to feel that they are inspired. People's energy is worn down right now inspiration is what people are looking for is like clarity, like give me what I need to get my job done. Like really, you know, efficiently and, and inspire me because I need renewed energy. And so a leader, you know, based on this idea, be impeccable for your 50%, a leader really wants to, you know, be like, who do I need to show up as in order to create that weather, like to really, really be intentional because that's what you can control these days in an environment where so much outside of us we can't control. 
And I would say to me, to link it to they, that's where grace comes in. That's where the intentionality of acting for others. Um, sadly, we're coming to the end of this program. Uh, there's so much more you have to offer. Um, but um, I want to ask you a personal question about grace. Do you have an example that you like to share or that you've seen or any experience in your own life? So, Yes, I I um. I, I just love that you make a stand for grace and that you remind us uh, of that. And, you know, grace is when I think is kind of like when light comes in and helps us transcend the crunch of the moment right? and connects us to um, uh, our humanity and the things that really are the eternal truths and what's really important. And for me, you know, I experience grace when I'm in the presence of um, uh, either whether it's the natural world that is so much bigger than me and reminds me of kind of the, you know, the generations or when I connect um, to kind of my my sense of, of spirituality and um, and and uh, just for, for me, it's it's kind of a. A, a sense of a, a flow, like streaming rays of light, you know, that come in and, and kind of surround me like a, a cone. And I feel like, um, you, you know, that I'm, I'm connected to a higher purpose. So that's for me, like, you know, really, um, anytime I'm doing my work, uh, I actually like step into that literally before I kind of get on, you know, a podcast or, you know, with clients. And I'm always trying to access that, especially when people are talking to me about things that are really hard. Like, how can I be that streaming ray of light to uplift them and to bring that kind of into that vibration, uh, if you will. And I also think the the other way that I uh, access that grace is for me in the moments of tender connection. Like, you know, um, uh, there was a, a moment several weeks ago when I, I just um, felt like a number of things that I was doing just, you know, weren't kind of, you know, getting, getting, getting traction or kind of working in those moments. And it was just, you know, we all have those uh, kind of moments. And I just, I just allowed myself to just kind of like feel it, the frustration of it so that I could move through it and kind of get to a more problem solving moment. And my girlfriend um, was just, uh, she just really, really held the space for me. And she was so empathically attuned and her voice was so tender that it really, it felt like it brought in those streaming rays of light, you know, for me. And I felt like connected to a sense of um, being understood and being loved and that there was something, um, uh, a, a love that was so much, that was interpersonal between us, but that was so much bigger uh, as well in the world that people could access. And I just thought, this is the renewable energy that we all seek. That's a lovely story. I like how you linked the idea of grace to the concept of light or enlightenment, one might say, that you strive to give to others. And it's so good you have the return, the reciprocity of your friend, your girlfriend shared with you. And so that's, and grace is, uh, lives on, and, and foam, and grace nurtures love. So we're all in this together. And that makes it so powerful. Um, uh, we are at the end of our show, but how, tell us how people can find you, Sharon. Thank you so much. So, you know, probably uh, my website, www.sharonmelnick.com. Uh, would be a, a great place to connect. Uh, so, and if there's any way that I could uh, support you personally to uh, be effective, to be a, a resilient leader. And uh, of course, you know, this is so important to prevent burnout, to help your people, your team members, your organization, your group to uh, prevent the effect of mental health uh, issues and to really get so worn down that they can't be kind of effective. And uh, I know that Effective leaders these days are balancing, um, you know, the ability to have completion with compassion. And I think uh, being there for your people personally, as well as providing them with those tools. And um, also, you know, uh, the Success Under Stress book is also uh, a great place to start and trainings that are based on it. Great. And we will put the link in the description of the video that goes out. So thank you, Sharon. You've been a terrific guest. Always good to talk to you. And with that, we are going to go out. So thank you so much, John.